We continue today with chapter 20, The Vision of Sinlessness. Vision will come to you at first in glimpses, but they will be enough to show you what is given you who see your brother sinless. Truth is restored to you through your desire, as it was lost to you through your desire for something else. Open the holy place that you closed off by valuing the quote something else, and what was never lost will quietly return. It has been saved for you. Vision would not be necessary had judgment not been made. Desire now its whole undoing, and it is done for you. Do you not want to know your own identity? Would you not happily exchange your doubts for certainty? Would you not willingly be free of misery and learn again of joy? Your holy relationship offers all this to you. As it was given you, so will be its effects. And as its holy purpose was not made by you, the means by which its happy end is yours is also not of you. Rejoice in what is yours, but for the asking, and think not that you need make either a means or end. All this is given you, who would but see your brother sinless. All this is given, waiting on your desire but to receive it. Vision is freely given to those who ask to see. Your brother's sinlessness is given you in shining light, to look on with the Holy Spirit's vision and to rejoice in along with Him. For peace will come to all who ask for it with real desire and sincerity of purpose, shared with the Holy Spirit and at one with Him on what salvation is. Be willing then to see your brother sinless, that Christ may rise before your vision and give you joy, and place no value on your brother's body which holds him to illusions of what he is. It is his desire to see his sinlessness as it is yours. And bless the Son of God in your relationship, nor see in him what you have made of him. The Holy Spirit guarantees that what God willed and gave you shall be yours. This is your purpose now, and the vision that makes it yours is ready to be given. You have the vision that enables you to see the body not, and as you look beyond your brother, you will see an altar to your father, holy as in heaven, glowing with radiant purity and sparkling with the shining lilies you laid upon it. What can you value more than this? Why do you think the body is a better home, a safe for shelter for God's Son? Why would you rather look on it than on the truth? How can the engine of destruction be preferred and chosen to replace the holy home the Holy Spirit offers, where He will dwell with you? The body is the sign of weakness, vulnerability, and loss of power. Can such a Savior help you? Would you turn in your distress and need or help unto the helpless? Is the pitifully little the perfect choice to call upon for strength? Judgment will seem to make your Savior weak, yet it is you who need his strength. There is no problem, no event, or situation, no perplexity that vision will not solve. All is redeemed when looked upon with vision, for this is not your sight, and brings with it the laws beloved of him whose sight it is. Everything looked upon with vision falls gently into place according to the laws brought to it by his calm and certain sight. The end for everything he looks upon is always sure, for it will meet his purpose seen in unadjusted form and suited perfectly to meet it. Destructiveness becomes benign, and sin is turned to blessing under his gentle gaze. What can the body's eyes perceive 
with power to correct. Its eyes adjust to sin, unable to overlook it in any form and seeing it everywhere, in everything. Look through its eyes and everything will stand condemned before you. All that could save you, you will never see. Your holy relationship, the source of your salvation, will be deprived of meaning and its most holy purpose bereft of means for its accomplishment. Judgment is but a toy, a whim, the senseless means to play the idle game of death in your imagination. But vision sets all things right, bringing them gently within the kindly sway of heaven's laws. What if you recognize this world is an hallucination? What if you really understood you made it up? What if you realize that those who seem to walk about in it, to sin and die, attack and murder and destroy themselves, are wholly unreal? Could you have faith in what you see, if you accepted this? And would you see it? Hallucinations disappear when they are recognized for what they are. This is the healing and the remedy. Believe them not and they are gone. And all you need to do is recognize that you did this. Once you accept this simple fact and take unto yourself the power you gave them, you are released from them. One thing is sure, hallucinations serve a purpose, and when that purpose is no longer held, they disappear. Therefore, the question never is whether you want them, but always, do you want the purpose that they serve? This world seems to hold out many purposes, each different and with different values, yet they are all the same. Again, there is no order, only a seeming hierarchy of values. Only two purposes are possible, and one is sin, the other holiness. Nothing is in between, and which you choose determines what you see. For what you see is merely how you elect to meet your goal. Hallucinations serve to meet the goal of madness. They are the means by which the outside world, projected from within, adjusts to sin and seems to witness to its reality. It still is true that nothing is without. Yet upon nothing are all projections made, for it is the projection that gives the quote nothing all the meaning that it holds. What has no meaning cannot be perceived, and meaning always looks within to find itself, and then looks out. All meaning that you give the world outside must thus reflect the sight you saw within, or better, if you saw it all, or merely judged against. Vision is the means by which the Holy Spirit translates your nightmares into happy dreams, your wild hallucinations that show you all the fearful outcomes of imagined sin into the calm and reassuring sights with which the, He would replace them. These gentle sights and sounds are looked on happily and heard with joy. They are his substitutes for all the terrifying sights and screaming sounds the ego's purpose brought to your horrified awareness. They step away from sin, reminding you that it is not reality which frightens you, and that the errors which you made can be corrected. When you have looked on what seemed terrifying and seen it change to sights of loveliness and peace, when you have looked on scenes of violence and death and watched them change to quiet views of gardens under open skies with clear life-giving water running happily beside them in dancing brooks that never waste away, who need persuade you to accept the gift of vision? And after vision, who is there who could refuse what must come after? Think but an instant just on this. You can behold the holiness God gave His Son, 
and never need you think that there is something else for you to see. And from the workbook, Lesson 165. Let not my mind deny the thought of God. What makes this world seem real except your own denial of the truth that lies beyond? What but your thoughts of misery and death obscure the perfect happiness and the eternal life your Father wills for you? And what could hide what cannot be concealed except illusion? What could keep from you what you already have, have except your choice to see it not, denying it is there? The thought of God created you. It left you not, nor have you ever been apart from it in an instant. It belongs to you. By it you live. It is your source of life, holding you one with it, and everything is one with you, because it left you not. The thought of God protects you, cares for you, makes soft your resting place and smooth your way, lighting your mind with happiness and love. Eternity and everlasting life shine in your mind, because the thought of God has left you not, and still abides with you. Who would deny his safety and his peace, his joy, his healing, and his peace of mind, his quiet rest, his calm awakening, if he but recognize where they abide? Would he not instantly prepare to go where they are found, abandoning all else is worthless in comparison with them? And having found them, would he not make sure they stay with him, and he remain with them? Deny not heaven, it is yours today, but for the asking. Nor need you perceive how great the gift, how changed your mind will be before it comes to you. Ask to receive, and it is given you. Conviction lies within it. Till you welcome it as yours, uncertainty remains. Yet God is fair. Sureness is not required to receive what only your acceptance can bestow. Ask with desire. You need not be sure that you, you request the only thing you want. But when you have received, you will be sure you have the treasure you have always sought. What would you then exchange for it? What would induce you now to let it fade away from your ecstatic vision? For this sight proves that you have exchanged your blindness for the seeing eyes of Christ. Your mind has come to lay aside denial and accept the thought of God as your inheritance. Now is all doubting past, the journey's end made certain, and salvation given you. Now is Christ's power in your mind to heal as you were healed. For now you are among the saviors of the world. Your destiny lies there and nowhere else. Would God consent to let his son remain forever starved by his denial of the nourishment he needs to live? Abundance dwells in him, and deprivation cannot cut him off from God's sustaining love and from his home. Practice today in hope, for hope indeed is justified. Your doubts are meaningless, for God is certain, and the thought of him is never absent. Sureness must abide within you who are host to him. This course removes all doubts which you have interposed between him and your uncertainty of him. We count on God, and not upon ourselves, to give us certainty. And in his name we practice as his word directs we do. His sureness lies beyond our every doubt. His love remains beyond our every fear. The thought of him is still beyond all dreams, and in our minds, according to his will. Amen.